Thank you. Thank you so much for this invitation this year again here with you and Dr. John Gregg, Dr. and Professor, uh, Professor uh, Daryl McLean. It's a pleasure for me to be here and to be invited by uh, Simon Fraser University. And I want just to acknowledge uh, uh, our thanks to the volunteer that have been working hard to make it possible under the supervision of Ellen. And I really want you to just a round of applause for all the people who are anonymous, but they are doing a great job here in this community. Thank you so much for, for uh, your support and your invitation and, and many people that I met between yesterday and today and it's a, a long list of people that I am not mentioning but they know looking at me right now that uh, I thank them with my heart and, and, and with my presence here. So uh, as you were talking about the, the, the last book and mainly what I, I will try to do this evening is to talk about this quest for meaning and, and uh, the, the perception that uh, we may have about what it means to deal with pluralism and with, uh, uh, plural within our pluralistic societies, but not only here in Canada uh, or in the West. Uh, the last books that I have been writing are, are really mainly dealing with contemporary issues in which we have to deal with this. The book before Radical Reform was really about uh, transversely talking about the, the, the challenges that Muslims are facing. And this book is quite different. This book, in fact, is a, a kind of a meditation. It's a journey uh, uh, through many, many uh, topics that we are facing as contemporary human beings, not only Muslims, not only Christians, not only Jews, but also Hindus, Buddhists, agnostics, atheists, human beings, is really where we are dealing with uh, these critical questions of our time as human beings. So it's really a journey through all these traditions, philosophical traditions, spiritual traditions, and religious traditions. And I started by dedicating the book to the semicolon. And I say, why? Uh, because it's an international uh, punctuation mark, saying something which is quite important. The semicolon is, is maybe the most difficult one to use. Uh, and it's in one sentence uh, helping or, or leading us to deal with the complexity of a sentence. A complex sentence has many propositions and in between you have the semicolon. And this is how do we have to reconcile ourselves with complexity. So from language to understanding, it's to deal with complexity and to deal with the difficulties uh, that uh, we are facing today, not to come with simplistic answers to complex questions, but not to over complexify some of the simple answers that we can also get. So it's a balanced approach towards the reality of life. The second thing that I want to say as an introduction, three, three uh, four main points that I want to make as an introduction to this talk. The second thing which is important is uh, the, the viewpoint that what I am trying to do in this, this book is to change our viewpoint a Copernican revolution, if you remember, is, is to change your viewpoint and to ask yourself how it is to look at things from another viewpoint. Very often when we speak about uh, the object, we look at the object through our window, through our frame of reference. And uh, in the introduction of the book, I'm speaking about windows and ocean. Very often we look at the ocean through the window. So even if the ocean is, is uh, dealing with the infinity and uh, immensity and, and something which is no, with no borders, very often we look at it through our frame of reference, the frame of uh, our window. What I'm trying to do is a journey going and plunging into the ocean and to look at the windows through the ocean. So it's, for example, 
14 chapters. And remember, as to the symbolic realities, 14 is twice 7. And 7 is maybe the more important symbolic number in many, many traditions. 7. 7 heavens, 7... You know, we have uh, the, the, the turning around the, the, the Kaaba for the, the Muslims, and seven is everywhere in the Bible, in the Hindu tradition, the Buddhist tradition, Confucianism, and Christianity and Judaism. It's a very important. So twice seven is the linearity of history, but the cycle that seven is coming back. So, in the structure of the text, I'm dealing with our perception of time and our perception of the coming back. Is our time linear or is it cyclical? It's, are, are we coming back? So, the point here is to look at 14 topics from the topics and to look at what the different traditions are saying about them. And when, as I said, all the traditions, all what I have been studying for years at the grassroots level, through books, from Western philosophy to all the traditions, people that I was sitting with, you know, I learned a lot from people who are not sharing, for example, my understanding of monotheism, for example. So this reflection on to what it means to liberate yourself from your ego, I got lots of, you know, teachings coming from the Buddhist tradition. The Dalai Lama, for example, and the Dalai Lama, it's a public figure. I went there and I sat with him for days and weeks, but I got lots of things from anonymous Buddhists, trying just to liberate their self from their ego and sending me a mirror. So what I have to do in my religious tradition or in the philosophy of life. So this is an important, an important point is to change your viewpoint to get out of your frame of reference. And to do this, and this is the third thing which is important, it means that if you want to just move from your frame of reference, you need a bit of courage. It's risky. It's risky because when you are in your frame, it's, it's the comfort zone. I know what I believe in, this is good. I feel good because I'm not exposed to feeling less good not to say to feel bad sometime, to question yourself, why do you believe in what you believe? Why are you saying that this is your answer? So it's a journey towards the other to expose yourself to yourself. It's to come back to yourself by getting there, taking the risk. Uh, someone who was uh, uh, traveling a lot said, you know what, I went throughout the world traveling and going to meet people, you know what is the most difficult thing? Is to leave your house to go to the station. The first steps out of your home, this is the most difficult. Then you are on your way. It's the journey of life, but the first steps are the more risky because you have to leave. You have to take the decision. Now it's time to leave. So this is something which is take risks. And this uh, journey is something which is important. And with this, it means that at the starting point of this journey, what we need to nurture is a specific mindset. A mindset is the way you look at yourself, the way you look at the other, the, the way you look at the world, accepting its complexity, accepting your limits and your limitations when it comes to your own answer, it doesn't mean that you don't believe in what you believe. It, it doesn't mean that you are not convinced, but you question your conviction. You ask yourself, why do you believe in this and how the others, the people who are not sharing your views and conviction, why do they believe in, 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 in this or in which way you are, they are believing in it? This is the starting point of what I call, and it's important in the book, intellectual empathy. So intellectual empathy is, is intellectually to be able to put yourself in the shoes of the other and say, okay, from where you are, I'm trying to get the sense of what you think. 
understanding here that it cannot be wrong per se, it's another viewpoint that you are not sharing, but you are trying to get uh, uh, this understanding. And to do this, there are four qualities that are very important. And let me tell you this as something which is for me now the starting point of anything which has to do with dialogue. I've been involved in interfaith dialogue, philosophical dialogue. This is, the, this is my life, in fact, coming from Egypt, being European by culture, living in Switzerland, in Europe. The, 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 the story of my life is always to be in dialogue with people. And very often you are in such a discussion with people coming from other cultures and, and spiritualities and religions. You travel a lot, you go, you know, I was... Uh, visiting South America, African countries, Asia, throughout the world. And, and, and then you, you ask yourself, that's all good to discuss and to have your mind open. But don't we need something which is deeper than that? And the first that I understood, it's, it's crossing all the tradition, is humility. Humility means I don't get it all. I have something to learn from the people I meet. I have something to learn. It's a mindset. It's a mindset, this intellectual humility, which is exactly what all the students need, need as something which is the starting point of your intellectual journey, getting knowledge, intellectual humility. So the opposite of anything which has to do with arrogance. Arrogance is something that in all the philosophical tradition, just read Socrates, arrogance is the problem. To be arrogant, I know that I don't know is the starting point of humility. I don't. I know that I don't know everything. So this is something which is quite important. The second dimension is while you are humble, and it's tricky because when you think that you are humble, the only fact that you think that you are humble is a lack of humility. If you go to someone and say, you know what, I'm humble, I say, okay, I got it. <laughs> you can't. It's something which is the very subtle dimension of humility is that you cannot it's always to be questioned. You are humble when you always question your humility. The ones, the ones, when, when you think that you get it, you should still have to work, to work on it. The second is critical thinking, which is I might have my conviction and, and my thinking and, and my beliefs, but still critical thinking is I come back to this, which is to question my beliefs and to question the consistency of my behavior with my beliefs. So this is humility and then consistency, uh, critical thinking. To be able to question your own frame of reference. Not only you look at the ocean, not only you plunge into the ocean, you ask yourself about tolerance, respect, education, but you come back and say, okay, what about the, my frame of reference? So humility is the starting point. Critical thinking is something which is a mindset once again, is the way you are looking at your own, uh, uh, the own dimension. And with this humility and this critical thinking, which is something that we need in all our traditions, whatever you believe in, whatever is your viewpoint on the world, coming from a philosophical uh, background, an atheist background, an agnostic background, or a religious background, or from spirituality, the point is humility should be at the center and critical thinking should be your companion during the journey of life. But there is something else which is important, which has to be added to this, is respect. And respect, this is coming from the intellectual empathy, which is, I might not understand what you believe in, it could be different from mine, but I respect your viewpoint. I respect your belief. Meaning by this, that my respect is not only to acknowledge that you are here, but for me to try to understand from where you think. So, no respect without knowledge. Or trying to get that knowledge. It's just ignoring is not a sign of respect. Knowledge is a sign of trying to get knowledge of, of what the people are thinking. So, humility, critical thinking and respect to add to the first step, which is courage. These are the qualities that are needed if we want to develop a philosophy of pluralism. 
And there is one last thing which is important. While you know what you need, you should also know what you are fighting. And there is something which I find in my own religious tradition, but in many, many philosophical and spiritual uh, uh, tradition, which is for me something that we have to fight. And it's the dogmatic mind. The dogmatic mind is not only a religious mind. As I am always repeating, I met so many people doubting and being very arrogant with their doubt. Very dogmatic about the fact that you have to doubt. Which is paradoxical, but it's true. And they think that because you don't doubt, you cannot be open-minded. So they end up being very dogmatic with that. And what is a, a dogmatic mind? A dogmatic mind is not an exclusivist mind. It's a binary. It's a, it's a binary. It's a way to look at things through a binary vision. And it's as simple as, I'm right, so you are wrong. And you find this in all the traditions. People thinking that because I think that what I believe is right, there is no other option but for you to be wrong. And this is the way that we, we are not doubting ourselves while we, it's not a point to doubt the truth, but doubting ourselves that I might be wrong with my own truth, that I might be in contradiction. So this dogmatic mind is, is very problematic. And the dogmatic mind could come out of many, many dimensions. And paradoxically, we can find people nurturing a dogmatic mind because their mind is under the pressure of emotions. Very often when your mind is under the pressure of emotions, you nurture a dogmatic mind. This is what we get with populist parties today. Emotional politics is nurturing dogmatic minds that are not aware that they are dogmatic because they react with their emotion. And it's very, very, this is exactly the opposite of complexity. It's simplif sim simplification of everything, a simplistic perception of things. It's coming from your, my emotion. I'm scared of the other, so the other is the danger. So I'm right, he's wrong. So emotions, when they are not controlled, under the pressure of populism could nurture dogmatic minds. And if we are serious about democratic process, if we are serious about pluralism, if we are serious about living together, this is where we have to start. How do we deal with anything that could push us towards dogma having dogmatic minds from very strong emotional politics to simplistic understanding of the other? So it's all about knowledge, mastering ourselves, and mastering our emotions in the way we are becoming human beings. No humanity and humanism without education. Education is the way forward. And we need to educate ourselves to be human beings, to be citizens, to be committed, to be humble, to get this knowledge and to respect the other, as much as we respect ourselves. So this is a process here which is upstream from all the discussions. You can have very nice discussion about, you know, what it's very easy here in this room to be open-minded, but at the end of the day, if we are not nurturing this, if it's not something which is a journey, taking the risk of the other, taking the risk of getting this knowledge, taking the risk of intellectual empathy, to be self-critical and at the same time to respect, if we are not equipped, the journey is going to be difficult. And we end up with very simplistic answers to complex questions. So, having said that here, and knowing that uh, the dogmatic minds are everywhere, and sometimes we ourselves, we can be very open in many issues, but in very specific one, we can be very dogmatic. Be careful, it's not because on many issues you are open-minded that you are not sometimes dogmatic. Some are open with the world and dogmatic with their kids. <laughs> It's exactly the same with the kids. They are open towards everyone, but with the parents, they are very dogmatic. Our judgment here, and this is why I'm talking about being critical, self-criticism here is just to mind your uh, uh, way of thinking and, and to be aware of that. So uh, what I did is really a journey through 
14 uh, uh, topics. And the first one is really the very title of the book, The Quest for Meaning. Uh, the genetician uh, Albert Jacquard is saying something which is quite interesting. He said, you know what, when you are born, you are not born complete. You still need your parents. You are in need of your parents when you are born. Because after nine months, you still need your parents to feed your mother and then you, of course, you, you are in need, physically speaking. And this is the starting point of our journey. And when we are careless about the existential question, when at one point we are autonomous with our body and physically autonomous, the mind and our brain is starting to ask questions. Why? Why am I here? So now, now we have an other dimension of being in need. We need answers. So when we end up being complete, physically speaking, and that's okay, we can go ahead because we are educated enough, we start to discover with our mind that we are in need of answers. So by definition, human beings are in need, always in need of something. It could be physical and it could be intellectual or spiritual, we need answer to our questions, why? So the quest for meaning is this one, is why am I here? And there is no civilization, no culture, no tribe, no nation, no, civili uh, no sp uh, religion where you don't find this question. And this is why Mircea Eliad, while he was writing his book on the history of religions, was saying, the religious question and quest is part of the intellectual structure of human being. You have it in yourself. You need to answer this question. There will be no peace if you don't get an answer. And not to answer is to answer. Because if you are avoiding the question, like Pascal, Blaise Pascal is saying, that we are, you are diverting, distracting your mind from your death, because the scoop is that one day you are going to die. This is the reality. And you have to face why. This is the true question that we have to, fight, to face. And this is where all the religions, all the spiritualities, all the philosophies, everything is starting with this. And then the point is that this is where the quest for meaning and uh, this is where uh, we are trying to respond. To get what, in fact? All of us. What means your answer to this essential question? In fact, by getting the answer, you are trying to respond to your need, it's to get peace. At the end of the day, our journey is just to get that peace. I have a question, I know the answer. And the answer is, I'm here because God exists. I'm here because I have to, to find my, my essence. This is what Jean-Paul Sartre and Heidegger were saying. You don't know why you are here. It's completely absurd. You are going to die, we don't know why. And you were born, you don't know why. It's, there is no answer to this. You have to find your own answer. At the end of the day, your own answer is the way your mind is going to get some peace with the essential question of life. So you can avoid it by uh, having this kind of uh, intellectual distraction, but at the end of the day, this question will come back. Why? And if we look at this as human beings, this is what we have in common. With humility, we are just trying to get peace inner peace and peace with others. This is what I want. Give me the answer to my question. I will get peace with my heart and with my mind. An answer to a deep question is to get this deep and in-depth uh, 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 peace for my life. And this is where you can get something which is uh, the starting point of this journey. If you look at this, the quests are the same. Now, in the book, I'm, I'm using the image of the mountain. At the top, at the summit, this is what we are looking for, the answer. Some are going to say, at the top, there is God. Others are going to say, at the top, there is wisdom. At the top, there is liberation or nirvana. I'm, I'm, this is my truth. So, we may disagree on what is on the top. Because for some, and this is why the monotheistic tradition is at the top you will find the very essence of your life is that he created you for you to come back to him. And we have different answers. But the point is 
that there are dimensions at the top that we agree upon, that we can find similar answers to different routes. And this is to look at the mountain from the valley and to accept the fact, to acknowledge the fact that it might be, it might be one summit, but many routes to it, and that you accept that that you accept that this diversity of routes towards the summit is part of the, the humanity and to accept and to acknowledge is, is something which is part of the humility. Some, and this is what I was saying, the dogmatic minds are looking at the mountain from the summit and they talk as if they were talking from God's viewpoint. This is it. And others are looking at it from the valley. And sometimes it's not a mountain which is the right image, it's the desert, because there is no summit. It just, it's the infinity and you are dealing with, with no route perceivable that you are trying to find your way in this. So this is the philosophical journey here, or the religious or the spiritual journey is just starting with this. And for us, if we want to be serious about what I was saying at the beginning, this sense of humility, yes, there are many roots. Mine, I think it's the right one. But what mine is saying is that there are many others and that I have to respect and to understand that we may find common agreement and common principles and common hopes at the summit. So this is the way it starts, So meaning this humility. Respect is to acknowledge the fact that there are other roots. Critical thinking is I might be wrong by thinking in the way I am walking in that path is the right way to walk. I am sometimes in contradiction with my own values. So the three dimensions are here. And the last point which is important is for us to respect all this, we need to be equipped, as I said, with knowledge. This is why I'm advocating in the book that for us today in our societies, in Canada or in the southern countries or everywhere, we need to reconcile ourselves with four disciplines that have to be taught. The first one is history. We are losing our memory of things. In all our educational systems, we are not teaching history enough and not the right way. For many reasons. First, because history is, is the way you are faithful to a tradition, to a culture, to a legacy. But not only this, we are facing today things that happened in the past and by not studying history we repeat things without getting a sense that this is part of you know human history so history it's important to know from where you are coming and what is this cyclical you know uh, coming back of things in our in our life the second discipline which is important is the the knowledge of philosophy you know, in my community among Muslims, when you speak about philosophy, it's perceived as something bad. No, we have the Quran, stop with philosophy. And even in Arabic, uh, when you are talking about something which is, oh, he's talking too much, they say, this is kalam. It kalim, he's talking. And philosophy in Arabic is ilm al kalam, is the knowledge of. He's talking. It could be negative. But in fact, it's not true. This is when you are not secure with your belief. You start by rejecting questions. So when you feel assertive and confident with your answer, you're not scared of the questions, if you feel good with your answers. So when the questions are you know, uh, putting you in a situation when you don't feel uh, at ease with the question, it means that there is a problem here. You are on the defensive. But if you come back to the very long Islamic tradition or the philosophical tradition, we need to get this sense of philosophy, asking questions, and to get the sense of what was produced by human beings. We need to teach philosophy again in our schools. Because philosophy is to question the ends of things, not the way it's done. 
is to question the ends of science. It's good to be a scientific, but the ends, what is the objective? Is why? Why do you want to know that? Why do you want to know how to go to or to what is happening in the moon? Why? Why do you want to have the last computer? What is the point? Why? So this is something which is a very important thing, is, is, is the way you know, the philosophers are asking why when we are overwhelmed with know-how and how it works. So it's also the way we are questioning sciences, the ethics, the, the ethical dimension. Philosophy is important. History of religions and religions, not with catechism, but just to know that if we are talking about pluralistic society, how are you going to deal with the diversity of religions if we don't know anything about them? You don't even know what is your religion. Some are saying, I'm not a Christian, they don't know about Christianity. And we let the people think that you are free without knowing who you are. And once again, I'm repeating this again and again. There is a contradiction in terms between freedom and ignorance. Because ignorance per se is a jail. You are not free. You will be never, never free with ignorance. So when he speaks about religions, it's very important to get a sense of what Hinduism is, Buddhism, Confucianism, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and philosophy as well. All this together, knowledge of religions is something which is important. Why? Because these are questions and answers to these critical questions. And some people are scared of these people who are coming with another religion because they don't know who they are themselves. It doesn't mean that you have to believe, but at least you have to know why you don't believe, why you don't accept, why this is no longer you. You need to know. Ph philosophy, religion, and the last one, which is quite... Uh, when I am saying this and repeating this, many people are saying, oh, I didn't expect you to speak about this, is arts. <laughs> we need to teach arts to our kids, our citizens, our students, arts. Because it has to do with imagination. It has to do with beauty. Tell me the way you speak about beauty, I can know where you are coming from. Beauty is essential, imagination is essential, creativity is essential. This is something that we have to teach, again, in our schools, because the way cultures are dealing with imagination and creativity is so essential. It's so essential that if you are not getting this as part of our education, we end up confusing education with efficiency in economy and in making money not in producing beauty. So this is, these are things that are so important in de developing a philosophy of pluralism. This is the starting point of what we have to do. And in the chapter on education, I'm, I'm just going to this dimension saying in which way we have to deal with that. There are other topics, and there is one central discussion here that we have in all the philosophies and all the spiritualities and all the religions. And it's a, a very important question for us today. It's the very meaning of freedom. So this is a topic where we think that we don't agree or we agree superficially in to be free is to do whatever you want. But I have a question. In these times of mass communication, pressure on your mind, then when the publicists, they are dealing with psychologists, you know that. You know that the movies that you have in Hollywood, and now Bollywood, are produced with the help of psychologists. They know exactly what is needed for you to cry, for you to feel good or bad. Even when you go to the supermarket, you go and you enter, you think that you are free to choose whatever, and there is a music there. I said, oh, good. Yes, very good. They know exactly how to help you to buy. And you feel good. You buy, and you feel good. And you feel free. Ask yourself this deep question. How do you get this freedom? 
How do you know that you want what you want? How do you know that you like what you like? When people sometimes, even with music, are deciding that there is something which is going to be the hit of next summer. I say, okay, I, I, I listen to it, it's not quite good. And one month later, one month later I think, oh yes, at the beginning I thought it was not so good. And then, no, yes, it's good. So you are following a trend, playing with your emotion, and you think because you are reacting to the emotion that this is freedom. Now we know in neurosciences that emotions are not freedom. They are signals sent to your brain and your brain is reacting. You think that you are free and your brain is under very close monitoring, psychologically driven and emotionally driven and you think that you are free and we have to ask ourselves how do you get that freedom? Kant the philosopher Kant and Rousseau were saying there is never absolute freedom. It's always, there are always limitations to freedom. In fact, to experience freedom, you need to have limitations to freedom. No limitation, you are not going to be free. And there is an old story, a philosophical novel. You heard about Robinson Crusoe. You got this, you know, uh, story uh, of this young guy arriving in an island. In fact, this story, we have also this story in Ibn Tufail, Hay Ibn al-Yaqazan. It's someone who arrived in the island and he's free. And then nothing, just the limitation of life that he, ha he needs to eat and drink. And, and then he starts to think about what is the meaning of my freedom. And he starts to put law in a free space. Because with the law, he's going to experience the true freedom. And this is something which is important for all of us. All the philosophers, all the spiritualities are telling us, you will never experience freedom if you don't get a sense of what discipline is. When I was, as I told you, with the Dalai Lama, four o'clock in the morning, he was reciting and reciting, very disciplined. And I was asking him, why are you doing this? Coming from an Islamic tradition, I know that we have something telling us prayer is better than to sleep. Wake up. Wake up and pray. This is the way you free yourself. And he was telling me, you know what? This is the way I'm freeing myself from my ego. Telling me I wake up with discipline to free myself from my ego because without discipline, my ego is the first jail of myself. I, get, I got it. I understand what you mean. That if you are at the surface of your emotion, you are in jail. That spirituality is to come deep down your ego to free yourself from the surface. So this is the difference between spirituality and emotion. Emotion is what you get at the surface of your being. Spirituality is what you get at the bottom of your heart. And you will find this in all the traditions. When I talk like this, a Christian say, I get it. Someone following Socrates say, I get that. A Buddhist, yes, I get it. A Muslim, I get it. A Jew, I get it. Why? Because this is the very essence of our freedom. When are we free? Even contemporary psychologists, the bestseller, in, uh, emotional intelligence is saying master your emotions if not you are going to be trapped by emotions so this is where you come with discipline and if why am I saying that you need to learn arts because arts is saying us exactly the same lesson when you listen to a pianist and when he is improvising and you see wow he seems to be completely free in fact behind this freedom there are hours of demanding, mastering the technique of playing. He can improvise in such a way, improvisation is such visible that he, he seems or she seems not having a technique because she or he masters the technique. So there is discipline to get freedom. Spirituality is about this, is master your heart Master your being in, get, in order to get this, this freedom and ask yourself, why are you doing what you are doing?
why do you think what you are thinking? So there is exactly a paradoxical reality here that instead of being at the surface, you have to come back to the, the dimension. And this is why in a, a chapter on emotion and spirituality, I'm comparing and say, you know what? Emotion is to spirituality what physical attraction is to love. Hmm. Do you follow that? <laughs> so what does he mean? I just mean that sometimes you can be physically attracted. It doesn't mean that you love. So sometimes you are driven and physical attraction could be a jail. It's not freedom. Love is how do you go beyond that? So this is something which is common to all of us. And what I was just trying to do now is to plunge into the topic and to get a sense of the windows. And we can see here that we are sharing. So this is the journey, uh, once again, when it comes to our understanding of this dimension. Let me just come with one last uh, um, topic which is important. In one chapter, and I think that for us, beyond freedom is, is the way we deal with our ethics. And I was dealing with, you know, ethics of independence and independence, and independence of ethics. It's for all of us, when we get a this understanding that we should not be trapped by our emotions, our sense of belonging to people, but to principles, and that we are trying to get this understanding that we belong to principles, is really to be able to understand the, the independence of ethics. At the end of the day, if you think that things are right or things are wrong, you shouldn't be driven by, by the people you belong to. You should be critical in the name of the ethics. So this self-critical approach is very important. So it's exactly the opposite of being nationalist or, or, or close-minded about my people right or wrong. And in this globalized world today, this is what we see. We see people coming back to, this is my pe these are my people, and I'm protecting my people. And we are nurturing a sense of otherness and creating the other, just to be able to create or to be clear with who we are. If we come with this, it's going to be very dangerous. It's all this business, all this discussion about identity perceived as a very close world where this is me, this is us, in order to say who we are not. So we are not basing our, our understanding of our relationship on principles. And we accept sometimes for others what we don't accept for ourselves. And sometimes it's at the highest level. You know, in, with all what is happening, for example, today in Egypt, and I have been, you know, asked about this. I say, let us be consistent that we need freedom for ourselves and we lack democracy for ourselves. Let us ask the same for the other. That it's not for the sake of security, let us have dictatorship there and democracy here. Like this, we are secure. That's not consistent. This is a betrayal of our principles. It's just talking about ourselves, my security, whatever happens to you. Ethics, independence of ethics means that you have to have this self-critical approach. Too much of us protecting our interests, forgetting our principles in the name of security and stability. And I think that cannot work like that. One day the people are going to say, what about us? Don't we have the same dignity as you? I think that we have to listen to these voices, and especially with people not having the same power as we have, because at the end of the day, we have power. And we have the power of the industrialized society, the advanced society, and we have to take this as a responsibility to be able to come with these ethics and these values and these principles. And this is something which is a great responsibility. You know, I, I, I don't agree with all these people who are sitting and blaming the governments. Because at the end of the day, we have the governments we deserve. We also have to be involved in the discussion and say, this is our business. We are involved in the process. And independence of ethics means that 
we have to look at principles and to promote the principles, whatever is the situation of our country. But it means also to be courageous, like Young, for example, a Chinese philosopher of the, uh, the 15th century, who went against his own principle by saying, I'm going to lose my job, but this civil servant is innocent, and what you are doing is wrong. Ethics of independence. I'm ready for that. This is courage. I'm going to lose my job, but I don't agree with what you are doing. I'm going to pay the price. I think that this is also something which is a, a dimension of freedom, that you can say, ethics of independence, I'm not going to follow the people. I'm ready to stand for what is right, even if it's against my people. And it's coming from a very old tradition, 15th century. Uh, 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 a Chinese philosopher helping us to understand in which way you have to be courageous with your own principles and to be independent. Independence means to go against what the people or the majority of the people are thinking. It's not easy, but it's necessary. This is our dignity when the people are even able to do this. And I think that this is where the courage is so important, uh, adding uh, this to, to uh, uh, humility that I was talking about and dealing with intellectual empathy. Let me end with one story. One of my teachers, you know, when I was uh, teaching at, in a secondary school, I started in secondary school in, in Geneva. There was one, uh, I, I wrote a, 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 a text about him, and, and it's part of, of what I, I was writing in this text, the philosophy of pluralism, because I wrote many texts about what uh, did my students teach me over the years? You know, I was supposed to teach them and it taught me a lot. And one was a young uh, student, very difficult, very complex. He didn't want to be loved. He didn't want to be respect. He wanted conflict. He had the feeling, I am someone if I am in conflict with you. And he was always, I was saying something good, he was always uh, contradicting. And uh, once, you know, we went together in Africa, he came, uh, we had a trip just for, this was things that I was doing, pedagogical trips to uh, Asia and Africa for, to help the, 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 the young uh, uh, students to get a better sense of, you know, other cultures, other uh, traditions. Before that, once, he's... Uh, sister called me and she told me look we are in hospital and he beat my mother and it was very very tough I went there and and I was just facing this reality what happened and 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 uh, I was going to shout at him and she, she told me look she she took me like this she, look this is the way my father was dealing with us beating us and and violence was the language within the family and she gave me something which was essential, what I call intellectual empathy that I understood without justifying. Beating your mother will never be acceptable. But I understood where he was coming from. And when you understand without judging, or without justifying, your judgment is different. Where you understand without justifying, your judgment is different. I, I understand where you come from. This intellectual empathy is something which is so important in, in our understanding of this diversity. That it happens in our daily life is suspend your judgment. Suspend your judgment in the name of your freedom, in the name of your principles, in the name of your courage, in the name of your humility, suspend your judgment. It might be that you, you are going too fast in judging the people at the surface of their behavior. Within your religious or communities, or your society, this is something which is an important uh, take. And this is where I think there is a central concept that we need to nurture coming from that, is compassion and forgiveness. Uh, so this is also something which is part of all our traditions, but we have to be serious about that. Very serious about that, compassion. And as the Buddhists are putting it, compassion starts with your own self. To, to get less a sense of guilt, 
and more a sense of compassion towards yourself. You start, in the Buddhist tradition, you start compassion with yourself. It's not because you are doing bad or that you are wrong or you, are, you should nurture the sense of being guilty in, 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 uh, in, uh, guilty in everything. It's no to appreciate or to like yourself. The starting point of the, the journey in our life is this, is, is no to like your own self, to respect yourself and not to say, okay, if I'm feeling this, it's... And you know, in the religious communities, it's very important, very important. Today, I'm facing in the Muslim communities this problem, this, you know, obsession that you are wrong so God doesn't like you. So I'm wrong, it means that God doesn't like me. The, the, the lack of compassion towards yourself and then towards the other and to forgive. And this is something that we have everywhere. What is forgiveness is to suspend your judgment and to add love. Love more and judge less. This is the starting point of the way you have to deal with people and based on your understanding. So I would say that I found this in all the tradition when you look at uh, the way Socrates was with his people, not judging. His wisdom is not to judge. In the Christian tradition, exactly the same. The Jewish tradition, the same. In Buddhism, the same. Confucian is the same. In Islam, the same. This is what we have. And we are not respecting this very deep dimension of our respective traditions. Let us come to this. This is what we find at the summit. This is what we need to reach. And this is where we are getting it, to it, with humility, with respect, with understanding, and with dedication. But to get that, there is something which is at the beginning, is our relationship with our ego, with arrogance. And I would say that the journey is really this one, it's coming back to the very beginning. And this is why uh, some people don't like this story. But you remember the story of the alchemist? You read that book? He took something which is a very old tradition, which is a Christian mystics and Muslim mystics, they agree on this story. It's exactly it. He translated it into modern, a modern novel. Is in Andalusia. He said, you will get the secret of life in Egypt. He went to Egypt, and in Egypt, he got the answer. The answer is in Spain. Where do you come from? So it's to go there and to come back. But there is the, the, one difference. Is the, 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 the location where you came back after going to Egypt is not exactly the same as the one you left. You know why? Because between the two, there is Egypt. There is the journey. Let us do that with our own tradition. Come back to the essence. but going through this journey towards the others, with the others, in critical discussion and mutual respect. Thank you.